So, you know, out of all of these seminars that we've done here, and there have been quite a few, we've covered a wide variety of topics, I have to say that this is perhaps the most important. It really is. This is about catching live bait. And even though we're talking about targeting a fish that's this big, you know, or not much larger than this, it's absolutely vital to success fishing offshore here. You know, our fishery here in South Florida locally is different than anywhere else in the world. It really is. It's very unique. I know that there's a couple guys here who are up from the Northeast that I've talked to, New Jersey, New York. I myself am, are from up in that region as well. And I'll tell you, when I moved down to Florida a long, long time ago, it was a humbling experience. I was a great fisherman, very successful. I came down here and caught nothing. Okay, <laughs> caught nothing. Has that happened to anybody? Okay. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? And until eventually I just scratched everything and started from ground zero. Okay? Everything that works in other places doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work down here. We're in a region that's incredibly pressured. There's so many boats. Anybody go out on a beautiful Saturday morning or a Sunday morning? How many boats are on the reef? Okay? Yeah, I don't blame you guys. Okay? They said we don't do that. Okay. It's absolutely unbelievable, you know, and it's just getting worse because everywhere you look, there's more apartments, more high rises, more houses, more and more people moving down here. So the recreational fishing pressure is not going to diminish anytime soon. So we've got to get smarter. And these fish down here, they know that. They're dealing with all of this pressure. They're dealing with habitat degradation, pollution, all of these things that we don't want to talk about that in reality are happening. They're happening right here in front of us. So to outsmart these fish, you really got to think like a fish. And, and really the key is live bait. You know, for many of our fisheries, if not all of them, live or fresh bait is going to make all of the difference in the world. Now keep in mind, it's going to be impossible for me to teach you everything that we possibly can about live bait in, you know, 60 to 90 minutes. But I'm going to try and cover as much as I possibly can on a variety of different bait fish species. And I'm going to try and throw in, you know, some tips and some tricks and different things that we do uh, or that I recommend that you should do to make you more successful. However, keep in mind, if there's something that's working for you that you're achieving success, success with, continue to do that. And please tell me about it because I want to catch more bait as well. Because catching dolphin, sailfish, wahoo, king mackerel, snappers, groupers, African pompano, amberjack, the list goes on and on. It all starts with live bait. Okay, It really does. So let's first talk a little bit in general about bait fishing and understanding how vital this is. This is serious stuff. Serious stuff. You know, it really is. If you want to be a successful angler down here, you better take bait fishing very seriously. It's not a joke. It's not a game. It's not, you know, blah. Okay. If that's the case, if you're not going to take it serious, you know what you should do? Go play golf. No, I'm only kidding. You should go to one of the local bait boats and buy bait. And you'll understand that these guys that sell bait down here, they generally sell what kind of bait? Goggle eyes or pilchards. That's what you can primarily buy in our region. And that's what we're talking about, our region. I don't care what's happening in Tampa. I don't care what's happening in Jacksonville. That's not where we're fishing. We're fishing right here. So pilchards, you know, usually 25, 30 bucks a dozen. Goggle eyes, how much? 60 to 80, $100 a dozen during tournament season. $100 for a dozen. Keep in mind, when you fish these meat fish tournaments out here for kingfish, dolphin, cobia, wahoo, etc., it is not uncommon to have 10 dozen baits on the boat, okay? if not more. That's $1,000 in goggle eyes. That's a lot of money in bait. It really is for you know, 100 baits. Um, so you've got to take this whole bait fishing really serious. Otherwise, like I said, just go and buy the bait if you're not going to do it right. And even though these guys charge what seems like an obscene amount of money, they work really hard at procuring this bait. It's not easy. There's plenty of times these bait boats will go out and they'll get skunked and catch nothing. Anybody ever go out and catch nothing? Only one guy raised his hand. <laughs> right. <laughs> 
Of course, we all have. And the same, thing, the same thing happens to these bait guys. They'll go out there bait fishing and won't catch any bait at all. So, and keep in mind, they're losing sleep. Remember that, if you're targeting the goggle eyes, it's a nighttime fishery. And when we get to talking about gogs, you know, you'll understand how much is really involved. So let's start by talking about one of the most accessible and easily caught baits in the area, which is mullet, okay? Mullet, during the fall, we have a huge mullet run where millions upon millions of mullet come swimming down the beach, migrating, okay? And we go out there and we catch them and use them for a variety of, you know, bait fish species. Or I should say, use that bait to catch a variety of game fish. It's not one of the best baits, if you ask me. A mullet is not a great bait to dangle off a kite. It's not a great bait to slow troll. However, it is a great bottom fishing bait for amberjacks and groupers, okay? It's certainly a phenomenal nearshore bait for tarpon and snook. So there are some real good you know, purposes for mullet. We're not going out and using a rod and reel to catch mullet, we're using a cast net. And there's some things about cast nets that you need to be aware of, okay? Because again, like I said, we're gonna try and cover a lot of different bits of information about bait fishing. So cast nets come in a wide variety of sizes and shapes and materials. The most popular sizes are 6, 8, 10, and 12 feet. By show of hands, does anybody know the largest cast net that you are allowed to use in Broward County? Seven I've, feet. The consensus is seven feet. Am I right? Yes. You're all wrong. Every one of you. Incorrect. Okay, wrong. Nope. Nope. No, no size. Next. Okay. The, nope. Nope. You're all wrong. The, Wrong, 18, jeez, <laughs> that's a big net. Now remember, first of all, how cast nets are measured. They're measured from the horn, which is that device on the top of the cast net, all the way down to the bottom lead line. The line around the bottom of that net, when that net is closed, hanging straight up and down, the length of that from the top horn to the lead line is how a cast net is measured, okay? So an eight foot net, is going to open to 16 foot. Here in Broward County and around the state of Florida, the largest cast net that you can use is 14 feet. Not 14 feet wide, which is why you're all saying seven foot. Okay, that's where the mistake is. 14 feet from the horn to the lead line. So a 28 foot cast net. Nobody in this room is throwing a 28 foot cast net. There had been confusion about this topic for many, many years. Everyone is misled. They believe it's seven foot. It is not. It is 14, okay? However, the most common nets are eight, 10, 12. And keep in mind, if you're just getting started throwing a net, I would recommend a six to eight foot net. If you're pretty good at it, eight foot, you know, maybe 10 foot. If you're a professional, you can throw a 12 foot net, which is gonna open up to 24 feet. Remember, don't think that the larger net is always gonna be a better bet. Imagine if you throw a 10 foot net on a school of mullet and you load that net. Do you have any idea what it's like trying to haul in that net with 300 pounds of mullet in it? Okay, so sometimes you've gotta think about this and say, I don't need a net that big, right? Because I'm not trying to catch 500 giant mullet in one throw or 500 finger mullet. So, you know, keep that in mind that the size of the net is very important. The material, nets, cast nets are available in monofilament or in nylon. The better of the two options, undisputedly, is monofilament, okay? It's lighter, it doesn't absorb water, it's less visible in the water, so overall you're gonna catch more bait using a monofilament cast net than a nylon cast net. The next important factor is mesh size, the size of the net itself. That's really, really important. The most popular mesh sizes for our particular region are either quarter or three eighths, which we use for small baits like pilchards, sardines, thread fins. That's what you would use for that size bait or a one inch net that you would use for mullet. Okay, a one inch net. You don't want to use a one inch net for pilchards 
because if you throw a large mesh net on small bait fish, you're going to gill them, meaning that the bait is going to go into the net and it's going to be wrapped around the bait fish's gills and you're going to lift the net up and you're going to have a thousand bait fish who are dead in your net or struggling and you're going to have to pick them out one by one and it's a nightmare. So make sure that you use the correct mesh size based on the bait that you are targeting. Finally, and also remember that the bigger the mesh size, what's going to happen with the net? It's going to sink faster, right? The larger the mesh size, the faster the net's going to sink. So if you're throwing a net in three feet of water, you don't need a large mesh size. If you're throwing a net next to a bridge in 15 feet of water, obviously a larger mesh size is going to be more beneficial for you. The final measurement to keep in mind is the amount of lead per foot around the bottom of the net, around that lead line. It is measured usually either three quarters of a pound, one pound, or one and a half pounds of lead per foot around the bottom of the net. If you're just getting started in throwing cast nets and you picked up a 12 foot net with a pound and a half, <laughs> woo baby, okay, you better get a couple buddies to help you lift that thing up, okay, it can really be troublesome. So remember again to base not only your experience, the size of the net, the depth of water, you know, for pilchards, a good rule of thumb is one pound per foot, three eighths is a perfect match size for pilchards. For mullet, you're going to want a little bit of a heavier net because those mullet are super fast. You're often throwing it in deeper water, like in the intracoastal, where you want that net to sink faster. So you're going to want at least a pound, maybe a pound and a quarter of lead. There are some custom professional series nets that are upwards of two pounds of lead per foot, but we don't need to worry about those. So again, a lot of different options with cast nets and a lot to know about cast nets. And of course, you're gonna use cast nets primarily for the mullet. That's the only way to really catch those bait fish. We see the mullet coming down the beach and of course in the intracoastal by any of the boat ramps. If you want a couple of spots where, you know, man, I just can't seem to find mullet anywhere, go to the 14th Street boat ramp. There's mullet that swim around the ramp. Go to any dead end canal here in Lighthouse Point. Okay, you know where the canals, the street goes down the middle, the mullet will stack up right at the end of the dead ends. The nice thing about mullet is it's a very easy bait to keep alive. You pretty much can throw mullet in a bucket of mud and the damn things will stay alive. Okay, I mean, honestly. Um, so that's a readily available bait, primarily, of course, in the fall during the mullet run. It's also a great bait, those larger mullet, to cut strips out of. And keep in mind, we're going to talk a lot about catching live bait. That doesn't mean that you always have to fish the bait live. Okay, so you can use those mullet fillets as great strips off your planers instead of bonita strips. Okay. The next bait we're going to talk about is ballyhoo. Wintertime is ballyhoo season. Okay, sailfish season is ballyhoo season. There are millions of ballyhoo in our area, in our waters out here. They are not hard to find. If you would like to find Ballyhoo, I'm going to tell you exactly where to go and I promise you they will be there, okay? I promise you. Go right outside Hillsborough Inlet, go right to those little anchor balls just south of the inlet and 25 feet of water, the little reef balls. Everybody know where I'm talking about? Right outside the pier. You pull up to one of those little reef balls and you tie off to it with a rope. Okay, you don't anchor on the shallow reef right there. Of course, determine the wind, the current, which direction you're going to be drifting in. Slowly pull up to that reef ball. You tie off to it. There's usually a rope that's hanging from it. Okay, don't damage the reef ball. Don't drop an anchor on the reef. Come back off that reef ball. Turn your engines off. Take a chum bag. Put it in the water. Okay? Within a matter of minutes, Ballyhoo will be behind the boat. I promise you, they will be there. An additional area to catch ballyhoo is on any of our local reef patches or any of our local patch reefs that parallel the coast in 30 foot of water, 60 foot of water, 90 foot of water, they're, they're everywhere. They really are, especially on that middle reef in that 60 to 70 foot range, you're gonna find ballyhoo. 
Ballyhoo can be very finicky to catch. The way over the years that we have found to be the most effective, because keep in mind, you could throw a cast net on them, but they're very spooky. And the problem with throwing a cast net on Ballyhoo is that they're a very fragile bait. And once you get them in that net and they're flipping around with each other and the net wipes all of those scales and slime off them and you're crushing them in that net, a lot of them end up dying. So we have found that catching them one at a time is often a really good tactic because they seem to stay in the best condition. The way that we do that is with just a very light spinning rod with a small little float, four pound test, ultra light four pound test line, a leader, with a very small gold hook, a very, very tiny gold hook with a little piece of squid. And the reason I say squid is because it stays on the hook really well. Okay, whereas if you put a little piece of meat or chum or shrimp, it often comes off that hook. So just a little piece of squid right on that hook. You throw it behind the, book, behind the boat in the chum slick and you just watch that float. And keep in mind, the only reason you need to float is because it's really hard to take a piece of four pound test with a tiny little gold hook and to cast it, to even handle it. So you just throw it out with the float, the ballyhoo will eat it, you slowly reel them up, unhook the ballyhoo very carefully with a de-hooker. And we're gonna be talking a lot about de-hooking devices. Never, never touch the bait with your own hands. Okay, never touch any bait. Ballyhoo, pilchards, goggle eyes. The only time you should ever be touching that bait with your hand is when I take it to put a hook in it. Until that point, I am never touching it with my hand, any bait. That is absolutely vital because it's very much like road rash. You don't see it, but when you touch that bait fish, you are wiping the slime off that bait fish and ultimately it's a death sentence and that bait will die. It's just a matter of time before it gets infected and it will die. It's literally like road rash. So never touch the bait, including the ballyhoo. And you can catch the ballyhoo one at a time. However, recently we've been introduced to a really innovative product that makes catching ballyhoo instead of a two hour process, about a 10 minute process to catch all of the ballyhoo that you possibly could use in a single day. There's a gentleman down in Miami, okay, avid angler, who's perfected a hoop net, and it's called the Bally Hoop. And his name is JR, and he's here tonight with us, and I'm gonna bring JR up here to, to answer a couple questions for me. JR, can you join us up here? Sir. Guys, a big hand for JR. Okay. Now, JR. Why don't you grab that hoop net and All explain right. to our audience here, how do you use that hoop net? All right, guys, very simple. This is the aluminum collapsible hoop net. Basically, push down on it, comes apart. Let you slide up just a little so our gang over here can okay. see as well. So basically, it's a two-piece unit, folds up, comes in its own storage bag. Putting it back together, push down on it, comes in. Voila, done. Easy to transport, easy to use, and not only is it good for Ballyhoo, I mean, if you go on my Instagram or on a Facebook page, you'll notice we catch pilchards, we catch Ballyhoo, cigar minnows, uh, speedos, and other baits. If you get them in your chum slick, you will catch them. So here we are, the boat's anchored. We've got a chum slick going right out behind the boat. How do we deploy this? What do we, how do we use it? What do we do? Okay. Key number one to this is anchoring up. Everybody's asking, what do you do? You toss it, you throw it, no, no. You anchor up, put your anchor in the water, put your bait, put your chum in the water. I lean more towards dry chum now because tournament chum and all the regular chums are getting stuck into the net. I'm having a lot of people complaining about the net, the having to clean it, how to clean and, it and whatnot. Right. So aquatic nutrition, they sell a lot of good dry chum that I'm leaning towards all that because it's a lot easier to handle. So basically you throw your anchor in, get your bait worked up, just put it in the water next to the boat and just let it sink. It's going to go right, current's going to take it, goes underneath behind the bait, and you come and retrieve it behind the bait. Sometimes you have a lot of current, so we add weight to it. What do we do? We put weight inside the net. Just drop a sinker inside the net and let it drift back. Some people ask, well, would it sink? No, yeah, it, that's what you want to do. The current is going to bring it up. So as you pull it towards you, it's going to come right behind them and ambush them. Other times we have the problem where there is no current whatsoever. 
and the, the hoop net tends to sink. What do we do? We attach a water bottle to the frame with a rubber band. Some people use a piece of monofilament, zip ties. You guys get creative. I, I recommend rubber bands because you have no issues trying to take it off later. And you just deploy it back. It's going to give you a little bit more trouble because there's no current. Once you have no current, it's hard to get it away from the boat. It's easier to catch the bait because they come closer to you. But eventually you'll get it far enough so where you have them in range and you guys can retrieve it. I got a lot of videos from customers using this on Instagram and Facebook. If you guys want to see better examples, watch the videos. Now, finally, there's another version, a stealthier version. And rather than the aluminum frame, it's an acrylic frame. So yeah. it's less, less visible in the water, and in turn, you're going to end up catching more bait. Exactly. And again, just to clarify, this is drifting out behind the boat. It's got a long lead line that looks to be about 30 feet. It's going to drift out behind the boat. All of the bait now is between the net and the boat. You understand what I'm saying? And now I'm slowly mm. going to pull that net in, and all the bait is going to go right into the hoop net. It's literally that simple. And even though you may be saying it can't possibly work that well, yes, it does. Oh, it does. Okay. Yes, it does. It works that well. And instead of catching ballyhoo one at a time, you can catch 50 ballyhoo or a variety of other bait fish, you know, as JR mentioned, you know, in incredibly efficiently and effectively so you can then get on the water and start fishing you know, as fast as possible. So for more information, again, Ballyhoop, what's the website? Theballyhoop.com. Theballyhoop.com. Okay, and of course, these will be up here at the end of the seminar. You can take a closer look at them as well. Um, that's what I was going to work on right now. Okay, so people ask why the different materials. Okay, why do we use fluorocarbon? Less visible. To catch more fish, right? What happens with this? When you put it in the water, water can be brown, can be green, can be blue. doesn't matter the color. They're not going to see it. So now your bait's not seeing what you're ambushing them with. Yeah. That's key number one. I think your question, though, is how do you transport Yeah, I'm, it? I'm going towards yeah. that. Transporting. This is a half moon bag. Uh, I'll show you guys where it comes in. This one collapses and now is a straight rod. So for those guys who don't have the space to put a half moon bag like this one, now this goes into a straight bag. So you can literally put it anywhere, attach it to your leading post, anywhere. So that's how that one comes. That's it. That simple little bag right there. Just throw it in a and fish hole, throw, you know, wherever. And that's it. In the, in the cabin, whatever. That's it. This one here in particular, no, you want to keep out of the sun. Keep it out of the boat. Keep it in a, you know, in a fresh area, out of the sun, because the sun will deteriorate the rod after a while. It is polycarbonate. Do, do any of you know what polycarbonate is? What is it? No. It's Lexan. Do you know what Lexan means? Bulletproof glass. That's what this is made out of. But it's not bulletproof. We humans can break it. Okay, so yeah. Um, basically, the ballyhoo are strong. Yeah, well, you're not going to break them with the ballyhoo, but yes. <laughs> Try to keep them, keep them out of the boat, keep them in, in yeah. a fresh area so it just lasts you a lot longer. And when it comes to storing, like I was explaining to the gentleman, it makes it a whole lot easier for other people. Because I always used to get, yeah, it's great, it's, it's a great idea, but it's still too big. Once you take this one apart, it's half the size, but it's still going to take up some space. This one's $199. So it comes in a bag and it stores like this. And again, for $199, I'm telling you, to go out there and save all of that time, energy, and effort to catch all that bait is incredible. So, okay, we've got a lot more to talk about here, guys. So at the end of the seminar, we'll address any additional questions that we have. Okay. Big hand to JR, and again, theballyhoop.com. Thank you, guys. So, Ballyhoo, again, an incredibly effective bait, especially slow trolling for dolphin, for sailfish. You can fish Ballyhoo off of a kite and dangle them off of a kite, but of course, just drifting out those baits on flat lines, and obviously, Ballyhoo are excellent for fresh chunk baits as well for dolphin. Okay, so a easy bait to catch and if you can't get your hands on any pilchards or goggle eyes every sailfish trip especially during these upcoming winter months can be started right on the edge of the reef by just grabbing a chum bag or some dry chum you know as he mentioned going out there anchoring up and catching your live bait it's one of the if not the most simple bait live bait to catch in the area so Next, let's get, let's get to the good stuff. Let's talk about goggle eyes. Okay, everybody wants to catch goggle eyes, right? Yeah. Everybody loves goggle eyes. Why? 
Goggle eyes are absolutely the most effective offshore bait in our entire area. It is actually a big eye scad is the name of the fish. We call it a goggle eye. You know, there's many names for them, but it's a member of the scad family. It's a big eye scad. Catching goggle eyes is a science. Okay, it's a science. I'm telling you right now, if it was easy, everybody would do it. It requires a lot of energy. It requires you to lose sleep. You're not catching goggle eyes during the day. You're not going to do it. Okay, you're, the only way, well, let me rephrase what I'm saying. Consistently, to catch a lot of goggle eyes, you've got to go out at night. Okay, the only time you'll catch goggle eyes during the day is off the piers. And we're going to talk about how to catch them off the piers as well. But by boat, you're only going to catch them at night. Now here, in our particular region, the depth where we primarily target goggle eyes. Does anybody know? At night time, the primary depth for goggle eyes can range from 100 feet to 500 feet. These fish swim all over the place, okay, all over the place. On most occasions, they're from 150 to 300. 150 to 300, and the key is finding them, okay? The key is finding them because they're on the move all of the time. So you can go out and start a drift in 150 foot, and if you don't catch them in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, you don't read any on the machine, you're not catching any, move. Okay, move another 25 foot in depth or another 50 foot in depth and do another drift and keep jockeying around until you find them. When the gog bite is hot, you could go out here at a Hillsborough or Boca Inlet at night, late at night, and you'll know where the gogs are. You know how you're going to know where the gogs are? That's right, because there's going to be a cluster of boats all fishing together, and you're going to be like, what are those guys doing? Guess what those guys are doing? They're catching goggle eyes. Okay, so of course, that's going to be a good place to start your search. Okay, understand though, Goggle eyes are very, very finicky. If it is anywhere around the full moon, you're not going to catch goggle eyes. Okay, they don't like a bright moon. Anybody know why? They're getting exposed and they can be eaten. That's right, because a bright moon around that full moon, everything is very well lit offshore. Excuse me, very well lit and it's easy for game fish to find the goggle eyes, even of course at night. So they tend to scatter. They tend to feed very sporadically. They're not schooled up and they're very challenging to find and catch consistently in any period approaching the full moon and right after the full moon. On any day when the moon is, or I should say at night, on any night when you go out here, if that moon is way up in the sky, you won't catch the gogs very well until that moon falls and drops. And then once it falls and drops, the gogs will turn on. And I'm telling you that this is one bait fish that turns on and off like a light switch. Literally like a light switch. You could be drifting, trying to catch goggle eyes. You're not catching any. And then suddenly, it's literally like the ocean just erupted in goggle eyes and they start feeding like crazy. But just as fast, they'll turn off. So when you can catch them, catch them as many as you possibly can. Now, catching goggle eyes on a consistent basis requires some very specialized tackle. And I'm going to try and do this here without poking anybody's eye out. This is a rod that is designed specifically for goggle eye fishing. Okay, it is not designed for anything else. Do me a favor, unhook that from there for me. No, no, not right there, right in the center right there. Yeah. Okay, so this is a 12 foot goggle eye rod. Okay, it is designed for one purpose, to catch goggle eyes. You are not going to use this rod to catch sailfish. You're not going to use this rod to catch yellowtail snapper. You're not going to use this rod to catch ballyhoo. You're going to use this rod to catch goggle eyes. The reason it is 12 foot long is because I am able to manage the entire rig. See where the top of the rig is at the tip and see where the bottom of the rig is in my hand. So I can manage the entire rig. And as you can see all of those quills up there, the reason they're not hanging Okay, is because they're just hooked right on the line to each other. But if you'll do me a favor, I'm going to put that right there, just try and unhook some of them, just so we can give everybody a little bit of a 
better. Oh, it's better than a chicken rig. Okay, go ahead. So there you go. Okay, that's a gog rig right there. Now you'll notice there's a couple more hooks down here by my hand. Now this could be an absolute nightmare to manage, right? Imagine if you had this rig, this is one rig, okay, on an eight foot rod or a seven foot rod. It would be a nightmare and you don't want these hooks in you, trust me. All right, they, this, this is like sabiki fishing, you know, uh, times 10 on steroids, exactly. And that's exactly what this is. It's this giant sabiki rig. It's a number 15 hook. Okay, so sabiki rigs, you can see right up here, there's all sorts of sabiki rigs, right where the tip of my rod is. Number 15 is the ideal goggle eye size. A little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, not the end of the world, but if you want a great place to start, a number 15. Most importantly is the lead. Notice that this is a very big sinker in my left hand, 20 ounces, 20, okay? It is vital that you fish nothing less than 16 to 20 ounces on the bottom of the gog rig. Remember that goggle eye fishing is not about sport. I'm not going out there to have a good time to catch goggle eyes. I'm going out there to save myself $1,000 and to try and catch as many baits as I can as efficiently as possible. If you don't have a heavy lead on the bottom, you know what happens? The goggle eyes that are hooked on the bottom swim up toward the top and you've got one big fat tangled mess. Okay, and I promise you, you will have one big fat tangled mess. Okay, <laughs> effective goggle eye fishing is a multiple person sport, meaning I've got this big goggle eye rod, I drop it down, I'm hooked up the baits. I now handle the rod and I reel it up and I lift the rod tip out of the water and I grab the sinker in my hand. And there are baits that are dangling from this. But as you can see, my hands are full, right? So in turn, I've got a secondary person that I'm walking toward who is unhooking the goggle eyes with a de-hooking device and dropping them in the bait well. It is very, very challenging to do this on your own unless I put this in a rod holder, okay, up toward the bow, and I then walk toward the stern. But it becomes, again, very troublesome. Imagine if you had six or ten goggle eyes on here, and these things are strong. I mean, they're strong. This rod will bend, you know, it, it'll double over when this thing is loaded up in gogs. It really will. So you've got to have the right tackle. If you're going to use a smaller rod, I would highly recommend that you trim the sabiki rig. In other words, you don't have to have all of these hooks on here. You can cut it in half and shorten it. But do not try and fish an entire sabiki off of a rod that's not designed for that long sabiki rig. It's going to be a nightmare. And all night long, you're just going to be untangling stuff. You're going to want to go out there in 100, 150, 200, 250, wherever it is that you're goggle eye fishing. Fish no more than two rods. Two rods is plenty. Drop one rod down to one depth, maybe 30 to 50 feet below the surface, and another rod deeper, 50 to 70 feet below the surface, or 30 and 60 feet, et cetera, et cetera. You're picking up what I'm throwing down, right? Okay, two different depths until you get dialed in. Where am I catching the gogs? And then, of course, you're going to adjust accordingly. Okay, and you're going to adjust accordingly. And you're going to catch as many as you can, as quickly as you can, when that bite turns on, because it's going to turn off just as fast as it turned on. It is not uncommon for goggle eyes to bite for 30 minutes. Okay, and that's it, all night long. They'll feed like crazy for 30 minutes, and then the bite's off. And you, you won't get them again. So keep that in mind, I'm going to carefully put this over here. And somebody had asked about the pound test, heavy, 50 pound mono, 80 pound mono. This is not about sport, okay? This is about catching these baits as efficiently as possible. You don't want to use braid because if you'll look at the guides on this goggle eye rod, this rod is not designed for braid. Plus, if you get tangled with braid at night, you know, while you're goggle eye fishing, that too can be a nightmare. So you're better off fishing just a heavy monofilament line when you're goggle eye fishing at night. No chum? No, no chum. You're drifting, okay, in different, let me just put that down. You're, no need to 
Okay. No, absolutely not. You do not tip the sabikis with any bait when you are goggle eye fishing. You don't put any squid or shrimp. You just fish the straight sabiki itself. They come in a variety of different colors. Some nights, the ones that glow more than other ones will work a little bit better. You know, some of them have a little bit of red there, you know, some different colors mixed in. The Hayabasu's, the R&R, Ray Rocher's line of sabikis, you can't go wrong with. Okay, these R&Rs, if anything is going to work, it's going to be these right here. This is one of those areas where stay away from the cheap stuff. This is all good quality stuff. Well, everything in this entire shop is absolutely top quality, including the sabiki rigs right here. Okay, but I'm saying like sometimes if you go to Kmart or Walmart and they'll sell that cheap crap, stay away from it. Okay, remember that these sabiki rigs are rated on the trunk line and the branch lines. Okay, so you've got a main trunk that comes down that of course is heavier than the individual branch lines that are coming off of that trunk. And then obviously you've got the hook size as well. And like I said, the number 15 is really a good size to go with. I cannot stress enough how important that heavy lead is though. I wanna stress that. With the goggle eyes, slow down. You go out there, you're goggle eye fishing, you're connected, you hook up, and you're going to know because once you're drifting in that depth, the rod is in the rod holder. Okay, you don't, you're not holding it in your hand. The rod is in the rod holder. You look up at the rod tip and it's going, what does that mean? Okay, I've got a goggle eye on there. Now you could be greedy and say, I'm going to leave it down there and try and get two or three or four. And usually that'll work and you'll get multiple ones. However, I suggest when you see, reel it up. Okay, get what you can as quickly as you can. Yeah. And in turn, be very careful. Slow down. You don't want to touch that bait. Remember what I said earlier. So as you're reeling that goggle eye up, and once you get it up toward the surface, and you grab that sinker, whoever's unhooking that bait, you know, work together, communicate, okay? Let them use a de-hooking device, as I've mentioned, and slowly and carefully get that hook out of that bait's mouth and let the bait fall into the bait pen. You don't want it to fall on the deck of the boat, okay? Yeah. Has anybody ever done this? Bait fish falls on the deck of the boat. It's flopping all around. Oh, I got it. I got it. <laughs> right in the bait well, okay? You don't want to do that with goggle eyes, okay? You really don't. I'm telling you, these things are super fragile. And if you're going out there to catch this awesome live bait, you want to keep it in the best condition that you possibly can. Because especially with goggle eyes, what's happening? We're going out there to catch the bait tonight. Are we using the bait tonight? No. You're, you tend to store the bait in a bait pen. So first you go out, you have to catch it, put it in the boat, put it into a bait well, and then you have to transport that bait back home, wherever home is, you know, or wherever your, your pen is, and we're going to talk about pens later, but wherever your pen is, and now you have to transport the bait out of the bait well into the pen. And then when you're going to fish, you have to transport the bait out of the pen back into the bait well. So there's a lot of movement going on there with that goggle eye. And if he's not in prime condition, he's going to die. Okay, he's gonna die. And then what was the sense of losing all of that sleep and all of that time and all of that effort? And I'm telling you, goggle eye fishing is one of those fisheries where just when you think you've got them figure it out, they'll throw you for a loop. Okay, you can catch gogs three days or three nights in a row in one spot, go there on the fourth night and they're nowhere to be found. You know, everything changes every day. So remember two rods, you don't need more than that. One in the bow, one in the stern. It's always a good idea to have multiple people on the boat when you're goggle eye fishing at a bare minimum too. Make sure you have a very well circulating bait well. Anybody ever go out, put bait in a bait well, get to your fishing spot, open up the bait well, and they're all dead. Has that ever happened to anybody? I see a couple of people, that guy is like, yes, yes, yes. Okay, it, it, it has, it's happened to me as well. Not aboard my CV, a long time ago on a different boat. And I'm telling you what, nothing could be more frustrating, right, than losing all of that bait. So make sure that your bait wells are really well plumbed, plenty of water flow. There's great options right now out there, not only with the typical rule pumps that we're all used to, but Hooker Electric has a series of pumps that are just 
unbelievable. These things are like fire hoses, okay? The pressure is incredible. You can use little valves to adjust the pressure, a little knob right on the, on the dash of your boat. So bait well technology has advanced further than anything we could have imagined. I mean, again, right from the dash of your boat, you can just turn a dial and determine how much water is flowing in that bait well. You don't want to overcrowd your bait wells with goggle eyes. However, just as an example, aboard our 39 CB, in a 70 gallon well, I can easily put 100 goggle eyes, okay, if not more. Okay, and they'll lift perfectly fine. We've got multiple pumps in each bait well, and that's the key, plenty of circulation, plenty of water flow. If your water is just trickling in the bait well, your goggle eyes will die. These things are strenuous baits and they breathe a lot. <laughs> you know, and they're under pressure. Remember that, they're not out in their environment. They're stressed. They're under tremendous stress. And again, the waste that the bait fish are producing has to be eliminated from that tank as quickly as possible. So it all boils back to that water flow. They've got to have plenty of water flow. You'll also you know, understand that these goggle eyes, these tournament sail fishing teams that fish down here in these local you know, sail fish tournaments, these guys take this game very, very seriously. There are hundreds of thousands of dollars at stake, hundreds of thousands. And when there's that much money at stake, every single bait fish is treated like gold. It literally is treated like gold. And they know the value. They know the value of a really live, frisky bait fish. They've seen it, we've seen it, I'm sure you've seen it. A sailfish will swim up to a goggle eye. If that goggle eye, is weak and just sits there and looks at the sailfish and goes, okay, eat me. You know what happens? The sailfish doesn't eat them. Okay, the sailfish says, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. Why is this prey not attempting to elude predation? Why is it not running for its life? There must be something wrong with it. And oftentimes they ignore it and they won't even touch it. They'll circle around it, but they won't touch it. Has that ever happened to anybody? Okay, on the other hand, you put a nice live frisky bait in the water and they go nuts over it. And all of these tournament teams, these, these guys that are consistently at the top 10, not only in the tournament, not only in the sailfish tournaments, but in the meatfish tournaments for cobia, blackfin, dolphin, you know, kingfish, they won't use a bait twice. So if they fish a goggle eye off a kite or on a flat line and then they bring it back in, okay, they're not putting that bait back out there. You are, you're taking that bait off the hook and putting it in your bait well and it's still alive and swimming around, and then you go to fish another spot, you're gonna use that bait again, right? $6 you're damn right it is, okay? That could be a $10 bait, okay? I'm gonna use that shit till it's dead, all right? I'm just telling you right now. And now I'm still gonna use it. I'm gonna cut it up and use it again, you know? So absolutely. But those guys, because the truth of the matter is, at that level, I don't wanna say money isn't an issue, but the goggle eye isn't an issue because they're not buying all of these baits. They're going out and catching them and they have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of goggle eyes all penned up. So they have plenty of bait and they know the value of a really good live bait. So again, on the gogs, just as a reminder, 100 to 300 feet, but sometimes you can't find them, you know, shallower than four to 450. And they'll be really, really deep out there. So if you see boats that are out late at night drifting in 450 feet and you're like, what is that guy doing? That guy's goggle eye fishing. Okay, so if you can't find them shallower, don't be afraid to look deeper. Okay. Another area for gogs is the piers, especially Lake Worth Pier. They stack up at Lake Worth Pier but it's a different fishery. You can't go up there at Lake Worth Pier or any of the piers up the beach here and take this massive 12 foot rod with this massive sabiki rig and drop it down on these gogs and try and catch them during the day the way that you do at night. They're too smart. They look at the rig, the water up there is crystal clear, crystal clear. I mean, it's like gin. And in turn, they see the entire rig and they don't touch it. So one of the tactics that are, is often used is something called a gog bug, okay? Where you take a light rod, a very light spinning rod, with a very small little, and I don't know how well you can see this, but it's just a single hook with a little bit of lead 
right on the hook, a little bit of weight, okay, and that's called a gog bug, right there. This is this this comes in a variety of different colors. The even just this plain lead color often does really well, okay. But obviously, this is designed to catch gogs one at a time, one at a time, and you throw it out there, and you just I'm just going to put it up the rod tip right now, so I don't poke your eyes out, and you just twitch it. Okay, and it looks like a little grass shrimp or a little minnow or just something that the goggle eyes respond to and they jump all over it. But you're catching them one at a time. Okay, and sometimes they won't even touch the gog bug. But it is something that you absolutely have to have in your arsenal if you want to consistently target the goggle eyes. Because like I said, they won't, you know, they won't touch those heavy sabikis during the day in that crystal clear water. Okay, they're very, very challenging to catch during the day. Sometimes guys will go up to those piers and they'll catch them off the pier and transport the bait. It's not uncommon for them to do that as well. But on a consistent basis, it's much easier to go out at night and to catch them out here. Stay away from the full moon. If it's approaching or you know around the full moon, as I mentioned earlier, don't lose sleep. You're not going to catch the goggle eyes. Okay, don't waste your time, don't waste your fuel. Now, when you transport these goggle eyes, it is very important that you use the proper net. Again, live bait wells, live bait technology, live bait nets have come a very long way. We're all accustomed to this sort of net, right? It's a mesh net, it's what we've been using forever. You scoop up the bait with this out of your bait well on the boat, because remember, once we caught those goggle eyes, we put them on the bait well on the boat, and now we're transporting them back to wherever it is that our pen is, because we're storing that bait. And we have to get the bait off the boat into the pen. So this is what historically we've been using. And guys, usually, if you have a lot of goggle eyes, and this applies to pilchards as well, to be honest with you, it applies to all baits, but certainly goggle eyes, and, and again, even thread fin herring. They'll take this net, you'll put it in your bait well, and you'll scoop up a whole bunch of baits, because it's four in the morning, you're slimy, you're tired, you can't believe that you just spent five hours bait fishing all night for 17 baits, okay, or whatever it is, and you just want to go to sleep because you got to get up for work in two hours. And in turn, you just scoop them all up and they're all flopping around in the net on top of each other. You guys know what I'm talking about? Of course. And all the scales are flying all over the place and all those baits are going to die. Okay, because again, you're wiping all of that slime off of them. All of those scales are coming off of them, flagged. So in turn, what a lot of people do, especially with the gogs, is they'll reach into the pen and they'll scoop one at a time. One at a time. So if you need 200 goggle eyes for a sailfish tournament, you're scooping baits one at a time, 200 times. Okay, that's what they do. That's what all of these high-end tournament guys do. They've perfected this because they know that if those baits rub up against each other, they're hurting those baits. Recently, r and Tackle has released what's called a wet net. Okay, so as you can see that this net is unlike every other net. It's got a little bit of mesh up on the top, but it has a bag on the bottom, a plastic bag. So now when I reach into my bait pen, the bait is not touching the net. He's sitting in water. Okay, he's literally sitting in water. So I'm reaching into my pen. I'm scooping up one bait at a time. I'm then transporting them over into my bait pen that's in the water, and I'm releasing them into the bait pen one at a time without that bait ever touching another bait or without it ever touching the mesh. It's called a wet net. It's one best thing since sliced bread. Now keep in mind though, if I take a wet net like this, and if I have a bait pen like this at my dock, which is, as you can see, approximately 36 inches, 40 inches tall, and that's floating in the water, Okay, and I now need to retrieve my goggle eyes to get them back on the boat. Could I use this net? No, because I can't even reach that far. So fortunately, wet nets come in a variety of sizes. Okay, and I now have a longer wet net. So I could easily reach down 
and scoop that bait one at a time. And while you may not think that this is important, I am telling you that this is vital. Okay, it's vital to handle your baits with this level of care. Okay, with this level of, you know, of caution. You, you literally, if this is where the top level is, is to do it the right way with the right equipment. Okay, so these wet nets, again, are a really big benefit. And with this, you actually can potentially transport more than one at a time because they're not touching each other. They're swimming in the water, in the bag, okay, and they're not hurting each other. So moving along from goggle eyes, let's talk about a couple other unique baits that are re rarely talked about here. Who fishes for swordfish? One guy. Okay, we got more than one guy. Who fishes for swordfish at night? Okay, only a few people. This is like a lost art, right? Years ago, if you wanted to catch a swordfish down here, you would fish at night. You'd go out and you'd fish a spread of four or five rods and you would drift out in the Gulf Stream and you'd catch swordfish at night. Now, everyone is sword fishing during the day and they're deep dropping right on the bottom. Why? You don't have to lose any sleep, number one. Number two, it's incredibly effective, okay, and it's really cool and everybody gets this big ego. I went out during the day and caught this swordfish, okay, deep dropping with my $5,000 electric reel. Right? And it's a lot of fun, there's no question. Very challenging, very, very challenging. However, the nighttime fishery is still very viable. These fish didn't go anywhere. They're still out here at night. So if you wanna go out at night and catch swordfish, now's a great time to do it. The bite is on as we speak. One of the best baits that you can use to catch swordfish at night is a large rainbow runner, okay? Where do you catch these rainbow runners? Everybody know what a rainbow runner is? Okay, yep, yes, yeah, sashimi. But it's also a great bait for nighttime sword fishing. However, you need a large live well because this is a big bait fish that requires a lot of room. You're not putting it in a 40 gallon well, okay, in, uh, on a little bay boat. This thing needs a 100 gallon round, you know, the big white tubs on your boat, really well plumbed. That's how you're gonna keep these rainbow runners alive, or a really, really large well with a lot of water flowing through it. Everybody know? Can you keep them in tuna tubes? No. I mean, you could try, but typically rainbow runners won't do well in tuna tubes. A tuna tube, by the way, little tube, okay, like a pipe, vertical, water's being pumped in through the bottom. You take a large bait fish like a bonita or a skipjack, you put them in the tube head first, Water is being forced up through the fish's gills and he'll stay alive in that tuna tube until he's ready to, to, to be uh, you know, used. Anyhow, right outside Hillsborough Inlet is like a little spillway, right? An outfall, we call it. Right outside Hillsborough Inlet. Everybody know where that outfall is? It's in 100 feet of water, directly outside Hillsborough Inlet. You know it when you pass by it because it looks like the ocean is like opening up, like there's a boil of water boiling out from the bottom of the ocean and that's a pipe. That's literally a sewer pipe that's pumping fresh water and treated waste into our ocean right out here. And however disgusting that may sound, it is loaded in rainbow runners, in bait fish. They swim around Gosh, I hate to say this, but eating the treated waste, okay? <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, getting back to it, if you want to catch those rainbow runners, you take that same goggle eye rig, that same goggle eye rig, the big quills, the number 15s, on a heavy rod, and you drop it down right over that spillway, and you will catch rainbow runners. Okay, that are anywhere from 10 to 16 inches, and they make absolutely awesome nighttime swordfish baits. Really, really awesome nighttime swordfish bait. Another great nighttime swordfish bait are tinker mackerel. Okay, very hard to catch, but you will find them in the winter time, the coldest months of the year, in 800 to 1200 feet of water offshore at night. Same thing. Same rigs that you use to catch the goggle eyes, 
two rods, you go out to 800 foot, you stop the boat. You drop one rig down 50 to 80 foot, you drop another rig down 150 to 180 foot. And one deeper, one shallower, you drift, okay, for 15, 20 minutes. You don't find them, keep jockeying offshore, 800, 850, 900, 950, until you find them. And then you catch these tinker mackerel that nobody even knows are out there. And they make absolutely awesome, awesome nighttime swordfish baits. They also make great baits for other species, but such a big bait fish is really hard to keep alive. Okay, so you tend to catch them and use them on the same trip. Another bait that, you know, is really, really good down here are blue runners. Okay, blue runners is another great bait often called hardtails. It's a great bait for big king mackerel. It's a great sailfish bait. Dolphin eat them, okay? Where do we catch the blue runners? There's Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. 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 Ever
Okay? It used to be a slam dunk. I mean, you used to go there, catch thousands of pilchards. Now it's not as good as it used to be because they somehow altered that water flow, but it's still pretty reliable to go there and catch pilchards. One of two ways to catch the pilchards there, one is with a sabiki rig. Obviously, we're using a much smaller sabiki rig with a number six hook, number six hook. Did I say number six hook? For the pilchards, okay? And not any of those bigger goggle eye ones. That's not what you need. A smaller lead, I like to tie on a round little egg sinker because that seems to get hung up in the bottom as least as possible. It's very rocky right there. Not only is it rocky, the current is ripping, right, in and out of there. So keep in mind, you're not going to drop a sabiki rig there by yourself on your boat. Somebody's got to stay at the wheel of the boat the entire time and jockey into position. I remember days right there at the bend where there's like 15 boats all lined up. I see a lot of heads going like this. You guys know what I'm talking about. And everybody's taking turns and everybody's working together. And let me tell you something, you got to be on your toes because that current is raging around that corner. And if you're not a good helmsman, if you don't know how to handle your boat in tight quarters, it is not, not far-fetched for you to end up on the jetty or smashing your boat along that seawall right there. So be very careful right there. But that's a really good spot. Typical sabiki rig. Number six, don't touch the bait with your hands because if you do, you will kill that bait. There are guys that go in there and throw cast nets also. If you dove under the water at that bend right there in Boca Inlet, I cannot imagine how many cast nets are stuck on the bottom right there. I've contributed two, okay, over the years. So I can't tell you how many are down there. Somebody at some point's got to go down there and rip them out every now and then because there are just so many. You know, so I don't recommend throwing a net. And when the pilchards are stacked up in there, you can often catch, you know, two, three, four, five at a time. So that's a good spot to catch them. Another good spot, oftentimes in Hillsborough Inlet. There was a couple years ago, you know, when you come in Hillsborough Inlet on the north side where that dock is right there where the dredges tie up? Man, the pilchards were so thick in there and big ones, like palm-sized pilchards. We used to go over there in the evening and, I mean, just catch, just annihilate them. You could black out a huge pen, you know, in a matter of hours on, on some, as long as that tide was moving, okay? Now, it's not quite like that. It's hit or miss. Sometimes you go over there, you can find them, and you can find them on the south side, too, in that little open bay area on the south side of the inlet you'll find pilchards in there also. But again, it's hit or miss. Ironically, or I don't want to say ironically, surprisingly, pilchards, you will often find them in the intracoastal in areas where you least expected them. I live on the other side of the Federal Highway Bridge. So when you come down, you come in Hillsborough Inlet, you make a left, you go down the intracoastal, then of course you go by uh, Atlantic, you go under the Atlantic Bridge, and then you make a right, and I live back in that neighborhood back there, Snug Harbor. There's a little bridge, the Federal Highway Bridge. It's way, way back there. There's pilchards stacked under that bridge in the, it, where you would least expect them to be. I remember plenty of times, you know, catching pilchards in the intracoastal, right in the middle of the intracoastal, halfway between Boca Inlet and Hillsborough Inlet where we would just drift in the intracoastal and catch them. So sometimes those little buggers will fool you, you know, and they'll be in places where you least expected them to be. But they're always all caught pretty much the same way, either with this sort of sabiki rig or with a cast net with what size mesh? Thank you, three eighths, okay? Not the larger one inch, or again, you're asking for trouble. You've got to do some research. You've got to look for them. Sometimes they're by Lighthouse Point Marina, that little island right there. They'll swim around there. So again, you've got to really just put in the time to find them. On the beach, oftentimes you'll find schools of them on the beach, but they're very hard to catch there. By the pier, Deerfield Pier. You can get over by the pier at two or three in the morning. Yes, I said two or three in the morning, okay? <laughs> 
anchor up, put a chum bag in the water, and you can catch the pilchards by the pier, oftentimes at night. Okay? And you know, when you start to think about all of this effort and all of this time and energy that's associated with catching live bait, you start to realize why these guys charge so much money for live bait, right? Why $25 a dozen seems to be fair, or $80 a dozen doesn't seem to be too outrageous anymore, okay? Because they do put in so much time. Now keep in mind, our area right here is not a great area for bait fishing. Miami, Miami. is a great area for bait fishing. There's far more bait further south than there is here. And a lot of the bait guys from here will trailer their boats to Miami and they will bait fish all night in Miami and load their bait wells on the boat and then just put the boat back on a trailer and trailer it back up here and drop the boat in the water and deliver the bait up here, okay? That happens all of the time. All, much more than you even know it, because you see the bait boat here, you're like, oh, that guy's crushing the gogs right out front. No, he's not. But man, look, where'd he get all those pilchards? Hillsborough Inlet? No, okay? And, but you think he is, okay? Oftentimes, they'll run the boat down there at night if it's calm. They'll literally run. It's not uncommon for these guys to run 30 to 50 miles in either direction to bait fish all night long, because the bait's worth its weight in gold, especially during this upcoming sailfish season. You know, it really is. So keep that in mind that our, we, we're in an area that can be very challenging to catch bait. It can be. It's, but at the same token, it could also be very productive. And fortunately, we've got a variety of different bait fish species that we can target here. The blue runners, the tinker mackerels, the ballyhoo that we talked about, the goggle eyes, of course, the mullet, sardines, threadfin herring. Okay, up by the piers, by Lake Worth Pier, threadfin herring, you know, stack up there. The issue with threadfin herring, though, they're very, very fragile. You cannot mix threadfin herring in a bait pen with any other bait fish. You can't mix them, okay, because they'll die. They're very temperamental and very, very fragile. This is also why a lot of these guys with these super center consoles have multiple bait wells, including myself. We've got a 39 CV with multiple bait wells. It's not because we have an overabundance of bait. It's because sometimes you want to separate the bait. You want to have pilchards in one bait well, goggle eyes in a different bait well. You maybe want to have ballyhoo in one bait well and goggle eyes in a different bait well, which require different water flow. You cannot put goggle eyes in a bait well designed, or let me rephrase that, you can't put ballyhoo, which is a fragile bait, or thread fins, a fragile bait, in a bait well with 8,000 gallons of water being pumped through there. Too much velocity, okay? And ultimately, you'll kill that bait fish. So it's a science, it really is, it's a science. Now, a couple other things, bait pens, you know, at the dock, bait pens are very common. You'll see guys will store their bait, you know, by their houses and all of the canals that we live in here. I can tell you, I used to live in Lighthouse Point and I could keep any bait alive in a bait pen. Goggle eyes, pilchards, thread fins, whatever, lived great. I now live, like I said, down by Snug Harbor, I cannot keep goggle eyes alive in a bait pen. Why is that? Water quality. Too much fresh water. The further away from the inlets you get, the less salinity there is, okay? With all of the out, you know, with all of the canals being pumped in and the locks. So I can keep pilchards alive, but I can't keep goggle eyes alive. And by the way, I learned that lesson the hard way. Okay? <laughs> right. Yes. Absolutely. If you get heavy rain, okay, will it kill your goggle eyes? Absolutely. And that's a big, big problem where a lot of times during tournament season, guys will have, a, a, you know, hundreds of gogs penned up, and then now it's pouring for 24 hours straight. So what do they do? They sink their bait pen, okay? You'll notice that the bait pens have floats to keep them suspended. Now, obviously, the majority of the pen is in the water, below the surface, but the floats keep it up near the surface. Well, when it rains a lot, 
or if they want to be a little stealthier and hide their baits, because guess what? There are bait thieves in Broward County. Yes, they are. I know that's hard to believe, but there are bait thieves in Broward County. And not only will they steal your bait, they'll steal your whole damn pen, okay, with the bait. Yeah, they'll steal your boat. But absolutely, it's happened to me, and if you keep enough bait in a bait pen, it will happen to you. They literally, I mean, how, how dirty is that, right? From a fisherman stealing live bait from another fisherman is disgusting. But it absolutely has happened and will continue to happen. So what they do is they sink their entire bait pen. So no one even knows that it's there, okay? They'll literally sink it. Keep in mind though that these bait pens, especially these cage type, okay, are not friendly with the side of your boat, okay? In other words, they will absolutely scuff and scratch up the side of your boat. If you, had a boat, if you have a boat wrap, it'll just completely destroy your boat. So be real careful with this type of bait pen next to your boat. These come in a variety of different sizes and shapes, square, oval, of course, round is the most efficient for the bait fish, okay? There are different kinds. You'll see those big white tubs that you often see on top of a dock, or sometimes guys will have them in the water. You're familiar with the big 100 or 200 gallon white tubs, you know, which you can buy and drill a million holes in. They work as well. I feel this works much better because you get a lot more water flow and this is a much easier type of bait cage. That's what we call these bait cages, you know, to handle. Just remember, you're going to need a long net in order to retrieve your baits from that bait pen because this now is well below the side of the boat. And then your bait is obviously well below the surface. So make sure that you have adequate net, you know, to capture your bait. Feeding baits, when you store baits, when you keep baits behind your house in a bait pen or a bait cage, if you're keeping them for an extended period of time, you've got to feed them. You've got to feed them because they're a bait and they'll die. They'll starve to death. Amazingly, they'll live for months and months until they fade away, or not months, but weeks and even months until they fade away to nothing. But you want to keep that bait fish healthy. Once you put bait in a bait pen behind your house or in a canal, they won't eat for approximately 48 to 72 hours. It'll take them a few days to acclimate, to say, oh, wait, I'm okay here. I'm going to be okay. Oh, boy, do they know, okay? <laughs> They're not going to be okay. Anyhow, don't expect to go catch the bait, put it in a bait cage, and expect them to suddenly be eating out of your fingers. That's not going to happen. It's going to take a few days for the bait fish to acclimate. At that point, feed them once a day. Best thing to feed your bait? Chum. chum. Very simple. Frozen chum, chops them off. There are companies that sell chum specifically to feed bait fish. However, the regular blocks of frozen chum work great. This sort of bait cage actually has a compartment in the top for a block of frozen chum, or for you to put chum in. So you, you can see this, you know, if you come up and take a look at this. And it has a little lid with a cage, because if you left chum in the top of your bait cage, what's gonna happen? Birds. Birds, which is another thing. Make sure that your bait cage or bait tank that's in the water has a lid. I've learned that the hard way, too. Okay. okay. Make sure it has a lid because those damn birds, man, they're smart. They'll sit there, they'll sit right on the top of it and they'll figure out how to get in there. Also, you'll also see bait cages that are mesh, like a soft mesh type of bait cage. Guess who's gonna learn how to tear that apart? Mr. Barracuda, okay? Are there any barracudas in your canals? Because there are barracudas in my canal. And let me tell you, they will tear those mesh bags apart. So it's better to spend the money and get a better cage or to make one. These aren't that challenging to make. I mean, if you have the time, you know, you can buy some mesh, you can buy some PVC pipe and you can make that yourself. Or of course you can buy it here at Chaos. I believe they have some sort of special sale going on tonight. So 
We've talked about a lot of different things, okay, when it comes to bait fishing. None of it is easy, okay? If it was easy, everybody would do it, and the bait guys wouldn't be charging an arm and a leg, okay? It's not easy. It requires a lot of time. It requires a lot of effort to go out there and do it effectively. You know, I think that there are some times, for example, when you are sail fishing where you just can't beat a live goggle eye. You can't. Okay, it's, an, it's worth its weight in gold. And if you're serious about catching sails, you need those gogs. How many do you need? There's times where you can go out with a dozen goggle eyes and have a great morning, right? Catch three, four fish. But there's other times you might need 10 dozen baits. So unless you're willing to dish out a thousand bucks for bait, be, you know, be ready to lose some sleep. And if you're gonna lose some sleep, make sure you've got the right gear, the right arsenal, make sure you've got a team of guys you know, on the boat that are ready and able to go out and put in the time and effort required to catch those goggle eyes. And again, that's the most important bait fish in our region. With all of the bait that you catch, whatever you don't use, what do you do with it? Okay, eat it, no, I'm only kidding. Save it, okay, save it, cut it up, use it as chunk bait for snappers, use it as bait for dolphin fishing in the summertime. My bait freezer, I've got a mixed match of all sorts of bags of bait, and then we go dolphin fishing, you know, I call it a bucket of love. I just take all of that <laughs> stuff and just chop it all up, okay, and you've got this great bucket of chunks that you need, you know, for, yeah, for the mix, exactly, that you need for dolphin fishing. So there's always a purpose for it. Bonitas is another, you know, you don't think of Bonita as a live bait, but Bonita can be a really exceptional live bait, those small Bonitas. The problem is they're incredibly challenging to keep alive. So you either need the tuna tubes, which keep in mind, locally there are some companies, I think it's, I can't remember if it's r, &R Tackle, I think it's r, r Tackle, that created these small tuna tubes that are designed for these small little bullet bonitas that we catch out here. Because let me tell you something, wahoo, sailfish, big smoker kingfish, love themselves a bonita. They love bonitas, that's what they're feeding on. Okay, and the small little blackfin tuna. But again, it's a fragile bait, you've gotta catch it, either hook it and deploy it immediately, or make sure that you've got those tuna tubes, okay, in order to keep those alive. Check and double check everything, this is fishing. And even though you're only targeting a fish that's this big, it's important that all your connections are right, that your tackle is in perfect gear, I mean in perfect condition, because even the smallest mistake could cost you big. And you know, put in the time, if you're unsuccessful catching that bait, don't give up, keep going, keep getting dialed in, it's a science. And the best fishermen, the best, most consistent fishermen out here, are the most incredible bait fishermen. The guys who catch the most fish are the best bait fishermen, or the richest people who just throw money away, right, to just buy an unlimited amount of live bait. But that usually isn't the case. The most successful guys, I'm telling you, on the water are the guys that are the most dialed in on catching the most bait. And it's a science. It requires a lot of effort, a lot of skill, and a lot of sacrifice. But it's worth it if you want to go out there and be really successful anglers. 